Welcome back to Big Riff Energy. This is episode 54. It's Tuesday, March 19th. Going to be cracking into a lot of topics here. Ben Riz is a busy boy in 2024. He's got two different albums with two different bands coming out. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about some exciting new metal releases that are on the horizon. Uh, I got an email that was shockingly kind and nice from a dude in what I would consider to be the most extreme, brutal, scariest, most evil death metal band of the modern era, pushing the boundaries of brutality to the point that a lot of fair weather death metal fans just abandon ship. Uh, so if you want to find out who wrote me, stick around, uh, and I'll get into his email and some, some emails that some of y'all have written in. Uh, yeah, let's see. For the most part, I'm going to be talking about Dark Throne this episode. Going through their discography, talking about my favorite releases. You know, they're 21 albums in, so I'm not going over the whole thing. I'm just going to sort of highlight my favorite releases, uh, tell some little behind-the-scenes stories of some connections with myself and Finriz and Dark Throne, some full-circle moments like I've discussed uh, in other situations on this podcast. Uh, yeah, but before we crack into Dark Throne, I want to talk about some stuff on the horizon. Ulcerate. You guys know about Ulcerate? Their last album, Stare Into Death and Be Still. One of my favorite recent metal albums and probably my favorite album title I've ever heard. So how do you follow up a title that powerful? Stare Into Death and Be Still. You gotta go hard. You gotta go hard, and they went hard. They have a new album coming out in June. You ready for, for the title? Here it is. Cutting the Throat of God. Pretty straightforward. You know, the death metal world is sort of overwhelmed with album titles that will be an adjective and a noun. And it's like a 15-syllable adjective out of some medical journal followed by a noun that's like either some sort of anatomical thing or like a cosmic event or something but it's like a lot of like di dilapidated or uh disintegrated or you know long complicated words for like decomposition and stuff followed by a noun that nobody's ever heard of you, look at the death metal world you'll see what i'm talking about adjective and a noun ulcerate is handing out declarative sentences and verbs they're showing us some action, some action with these album titles. And they're showing us some action with their music. Stare into death and be still. That's what that album sounds like. I don't know how else to describe it. Um, they're, they're a death metal band, but I'm not sure that that fully encompasses their sound, that tag. There's so much more going on. For a death metal band, they have uh, an insane amount of melancholy and emotional pain in the music not just in the vocals but in the music in the sounds the guitar sounds uh one of the best and most important death metal bands of the modern era i would say so i pre-ordered their new album cutting the throat of god <laughs> and man i can't get over that and, and you should too so that's exciting uh like i said staring to death and be still is one of my favorite super heavy albums that's come out in a long long time and based off of the single on this new one, it's going to be great as well. Uh, let's talk about Fenris because he's busy. He's got this new band, Coffin Storm, uh, with one of the dudes from Ara Noir and some other Norwegian dude. And the single's cool. Fenris is singing, doing like super over-the-top clean vocals, which is cool, kind of rem reminiscent of like Candlemas or uh, old St. Vitus, you know? Scott Rieger, St. Vitus. So I'm looking forward to that. The album art is awesome. I really like it. It's kind of different, you know? Similar subject matter to a lot of uh, metal albums, but just a little bit of different style. Those twisted trees and stuff. So that should be good. That's coming out in March. And new Dark Throne coming out. It beckons us all. Ted, a.k.a. Nocturno Colto, here's what he said. I have no idea what genre we are. And have really not cared much about it. But I know for sure it's metal. 
Uh, this is their 21st album. And they've done it all, man. They invented what I consider to be like real black metal. They helped invent it. There were, you know, proto black metal bands and stuff. But once we got to the second wave, uh, Dark Throne was at the forefront of that. And, you know, they have the unholy trinity of albums that really defined that sound. Uh, but over the course of their 21 album career, they've kind of experimented with every kind of metal that there is. And I think that's awesome. Uh, so here, let me, I'm just going to have Finriz talk to you about their new album. Uh, he, they put out a little funny video of him. So here, I'll play it and Finriz can break it down for you. Here we go. Um, Fenris here. We have a new uh, album out with uh, Dark Throne called It Beckons Us All. If you have a uh, need to know anything about the title, check out uh, Children of the Damned by um, Iron Maiden. For this album, when we were done recording it and uh, mixing it, Ted actually shook my uh, hand afterwards because he was so pleased. And I don't think We've ever shook hands since I met him for the first time in um, spring 88. So that says it. Pretty awesome. The album's so good and they're so pleased with it that they brought Ted out of his handshaking shell. Pretty amazing. Uh, so yeah, man. Let's talk about Dark Throne. Let's talk about Fenris because I've mentioned on this podcast before that I think we really need to give people their due and put respect on their name while they're still here. So I want to do that with, with Dark Throne, Nocturno Colto, uh, but specifically Fenris, man. So uh, how did you discover Dark Throne? Can you remember? I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, you know, this was definitely before I could drive. So I want to say 14, 15 years old. Uh, I've talked about this on the podcast before, just scouring, uh, you know, album liner notes for shout outs to cool bands or looking at bands, promo photos and seeing what shirts they're wearing. This picture of Pantera, Philip has the Dark Throne Transylvanian Hunger shirt on. I remember not being able to read the thing at the top, but I could read the thing at the bottom, Transylvanian Hunger. Uh, and you have to remember, this is small town Oklahoma before anybody really knew how to use the internet. So I'm probably looking in magazines and stuff like that, and I see Transylvanian Hunger. I don't know what that is, but I'm going to find out. Uh, we had one place at the time in town to go get CDs. It was FYE. It was corporate. Uh, they had some cool stuff. I mentioned getting into Black Sabbath and finding those CDs at FYE because I had like an Obi-Wan Kenobi figure uh, who was probably like in his 20s just showing me cool stuff. Uh, but in this particular instance, my friends and I went to Starship Records in Tulsa, the old location. If anybody went to the old location, I'm putting a picture up on the screen. For the listeners, imagine two... Uh, a frameish hobbit houses that are uh, one of them is like neon yellow paint with neon blue trim, and the other one is neon blue paint with neon yellow trim. No windows, all the windows are boarded up because I guess they didn't want to get robbed or something. Maybe there's sketchy stuff going on that we didn't know about. Uh, and it's two buildings, one of them had t-shirts and it was like more of a head shop. So it had head shop type stuff and t-shirts. The other building is records and CDs and maybe cassettes and, when, and that's it. Uh, and it's glass cases from floor to ceiling all the way around every wall of this building. And I think on this particular trip, we picked up the first Mastodon album that may have been later can't remember. Uh, two Neurosis albums, Sun That Never Sets, Eye of Every Storm, and then I found Transylvanian Hunger. 
Turns out the band was called Dark Throne. Uh, and I had never heard black metal or anything like that to this point. I remember getting all these CDs home. I think we listened to Neurosis on the way back, 40 minute drive. Listened to Eye of Every Storm, I want to say. And that was a big game changer, obviously. But that night, uh, by this point, I had a CD Walkman and headphones. And I remember laying in bed, putting on Transylvanian Hunger and uh, falling asleep. And I kept doing that. I just kept, and it, it wasn't because I was bored. It was just, there was some sort of hypnotic, magical effect that this record had. I had no idea what it was. I was like, why is it one drum beat the entire time? Why are there not really any riffs? Why does it sound like this? What is this? Uh, but I just, you know, it was a different time back then. There was, people in general weren't as inundated with shit 24 hours a day. So if I heard an album that I didn't understand or it didn't quite click with me, I kept listening to it because I, I wanted to, especially something as uh, weird and unfamiliar as that. So I kept listening to it. It finally kind of clicked and I became a Dark Throne fan. I appreciated what they were doing artistically for sure, despite the lack of riffs on Transylvanian Hunger. Uh, and then I worked out from that album. You know, I heard Blaze in the Northern Sky, which I think is probably their greatest album. It has all the best aspects of their death metal origins, the second wave black metal that they would go on to play. Uh, and I think it even has hints and foreshadowing at the weird O kind of punk take on obscure traditional metal that they would start exploring way later, you know? So got into dark throne. Uh, yeah, I'll talk about some of my favorite releases of theirs and then I'll start telling some stories about odd connections and cool full circle things that would happen later. A blaze in the Northern sky is obviously a highlight. Uh, I think the album that came out in real time as I was getting into Dark Throne was Sardonic Wrath, which I have behind me. So that's kind of a highlight for me. I, and I think objectively, that's a pretty strong album. But that was the first one that was released after I knew who they were. So it was like a new album coming out. And I remember getting into that, thinking it was great. I had the t-shirt, great artwork. And yeah, when I went and saw Goat Horror, I remember they were playing Sardonic Wrath over the PA before their set. And I felt so cool because I was like, I know what this is. This is Dark Throne. Uh, what's the song on that one? It's called like, I, I don't speak Norwegian, but it's like, Ale Gegen Ale. That one. One of the best riffs ever. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'll give my top five, man. Blaze in the Northern Sky. Sardonic Wrath. I went on to really appreciate... Uh, Hate Them. I think Hate Them sort of gets into the territory of like Fuck the Universe era craft. It's just really gnarly. The production's a little bit better than, than your average Dark Throne album. Uh, also, another great song title on that one, Fucked Up and Ready to Die. Doesn't get much better than that. Uh, so what do we have? Blaze in the Northern Sky, Sardonic Wrath, Hate Them, I guess I would put, I wouldn't say Transylvanian Hunger is one of my favorites, but it's definitely pivotal for me, so that's on there. But Old Star might be my favorite Dark Throne record. Uh, and I'm going to crack into Old Star, because there's some cool full circle stuff that's gone on with, with me and Dark Throne and Fenris uh, that resulted in like one of my proudest moments as a, as a musician and a songwriter. So old star, let me see when this came out. I think it's 2018 or 19. Uh, before I get off into this, I'm going to tell a little story, which I keep promising. to. Yeah. 2019. So, uh, spirit of drift released curse of conception. In what? 2017. And at some point, uh, you know, Fenris has had many, many like radio shows and different blogs and stuff like that over the years. To me, he is the ultimate authority on cool, underground, obscure 
heavy music. Uh, there's even a video on YouTube of him giving like a full blown history lesson of extreme music. And it looks like he's in a college classroom, but he's got a whiteboard. He's in a chalkboard and chalk and dry erase markers. And he's giving you the whole family tree of how metal started and how it developed into, you know, death metal and black metal and these extreme offshoots. So he's always kind of been the cool guy, older brother authority figure when it comes to heavy music. But I've listened to his radio shows and stuff like that throughout the years. And in, I think it was 2018, I came across an episode where this happened. Again, I'm just going to let uh, the man speak for himself. I guess it's kind of hard not to like it when you mix up old Metallica and old Trouble or whatnot. Uh, the vocalist's almost too good. That was Spirit Adrift. I d uh, still don't know what... Yeah, so there are moments on the path of Big Riff Energy that you remember. High points, peaks, peaks in your journey. That's definitely one of them, man. <laughs> Uh, you know, I can't help but flash back to being 15 years old and being freaked out by Transylvanian hunger on my headphones in the middle of the night. And then all these years later, the man himself is uh, appreciating something that I made. So sick. Uh, I'll tell one more story that's sort of a full circle thing before we crack into Old Star. So I go back to the, uh, I'll remind you about the Pantera promo photo where Philip's wearing the... Uh, Transylvanian hunger shirt. And for those of you who don't know, Philip and Fenris ended up doing a project together. Ibon, is that how you pronounce it? E I B O N. I'll throw a band photo up here. It's uh, Killjoy from Necrophagia, Satyr from Satyricon, Fenris, Phil Anselmo. I don't know how many songs they recorded, but you can hear a couple on YouTube. I think the one is called Mirror Soul Jesus. And it is great. It's one of the coolest things that those guys have done collectively. I always kind of wished that there was a full album of that material. But anyway, Anselmo is like a pivotal part of this Dark Throne journey that I've been on. And I think th if my memory serves me correctly, 2006 or seven, Down did sort of like a comeback tour. And I was friends with uh, Bauer at this point. So I'm sort of hanging around Kane's ballroom before the show. And I've got my sardonic wrath, dark throne shirt on. And we're all just kind of milling around. And as Somo comes up to me and looks at the shirt, looks at me, I'm young, you know, I'm 18 at the time, just some fucking random kid hanging around. And he, he looks at the shirt. And, you heard their new album. And I was like, what the cult is alive that was a new album at the time cult is live that's kind of the first one where you can really hear them transitioning out of black metal into whatever the hell they've been doing for the past 15 years or so uh i said new album yeah the cult is alive it's cool I said nah that ain't the new one i'm like what do you mean I'm like that's the newest one that's out he's like that ain't the new one though there's a newer one. It ain't out yet. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and he goes, he goes, you want to know what it's called? And I'm like, sure. And he leans in real close and looks me right in the eyes and goes, fuck off and die. And I'm like, hmm. I'm wondering if that's the name of the new Dark Throne album or if he's just telling me to fuck off and die. <laughs> but, uh, Man, it was a pretty cool interaction, and he he was super fucking cool after that. Uh, but that's another thing I'll never forget, man. Discovering Dark Throne through that promo photo of Pantera, and then making these kind of weird connections with these dudes I've been looking up to for the entire duration of my Big Riff Energy journey. Uh, so here's the cool part about Old Star that makes it hold a special place in my heart. Uh, 2018, Fenris is playing us on his radio show. This record comes out in 2019. And he has, him and Ted, I guess, have employed the services 
of my dear friend Sanford Parker, who mixed, uh, who recorded and mixed Curse of Conception and Divided by Darkness for us. And this is the Old Star is the best sounding Dark Throne record. I know a lot of you Cavalters and diehards want the lo fi blaze in the northern sky under a funeral moon production or whatever, but I like to, I like to hear the shit. I like the stuff to pack a punch, man. And production wise, easily their best album. Sanford knocked it out of the park as always. Uh, he didn't go too hi-fi with it. You know, he, Sanford has been listening to dark throne since they've been around and he understood the task perfectly. I think it's just a perfect balance of raw sound, but good fidelity, you know? It's not polished. It just sounds good. It sounds right for Dark Throne. And it doesn't hurt that it's some of the best songs that they've recorded in the modern Dark Throne era. Uh, I haven't been super into the last couple albums. What was it? Eternal Hails and Astral Fortress. I like the fact that they're experimenting with more like traditional Doom type stuff. I, I love the experimentation. Again, even if the uh, even if the result isn't something that I... Uh, listen to on a regular basis I just appreciate the fact that there are people making music for the joy of making music instead of trying to fit into some subculture or category uh, you know they're 21 albums in and I hear purists talking about how they abandon the genre and they don't fit the bill anymore and this and that listen man They've put out more true black metal albums than most bands will ever release for the entire time that they're a band. Like when you're 21 albums in, 10 or 12 of those albums are what I would call like true black metal. Uh, if you want to hear that, you got 10 or 12 or 15 albums to listen to, right? Uh, but being a person that's in a similar position, you know dude that's writing metal songs and, and getting, you know, on album five with spirit of drift now, and that's not counting everything I did before spirit of drift. You want to start, uh, you want to start pushing it. You want to start doing stuff that's exciting. You know, there's only, you can only really make Transylvanian hunger once. If they made another record that sounded like that, it, what would be the point? You know, you can't really, I mean, it would be boring for one thing, but they accomplished what they wanted to accomplish with that album perfectly. Like it couldn't be done to a T any better than what they did on that album. And I just love the fact, you know, Ted said, I don't know what genre it is and I don't care, but I know that it's metal. And uh, I'm going to salute the mighty Nocturno Culto and Fenris. Uh, dudes have been instrumental on my path of the big riff energy. And I appreciate Dark Throne and Fenris so much. And I appreciate bands that wear cool, obscure bands, t-shirts in their promo photos. We got to keep that tradition alive. Uh, yeah, Old Star is great. I, I, as much as I don't want to say that's my favorite Dark Throne album because they did make A Blaze in the Northern Sky, just the personal connections, man, something about it. And what's really funny, I'm glad I remembered to tell this, so I heard, you know, Fenris shouting us out on his radio show. And then I heard this album, saw that Sanford had mixed it. There's a riff on Old Star that is very, very similar to a Spirit Adrift riff that I had demoed by that time that would end up being on uh, Enlightened. But I, <laughs> and this is, this is just like, uh, I guess you call it mutual disco discovery or something like that. Fenris for sure did not hear my riff. And I for sure did not hear their riff by the time I had my song demoed. And this record came out and I heard the riff on their record. <laughs> and I took a video of my computer screen because I had already demoed our song. And I sent it to Sanford and I was like, can you believe this shit? Uh... And it comes from the same very specific influence that Fenris and I share. So it kind of makes sense that we would both sort of arrive at a riff like that eventually. But the fact that we arrived at it at basically the same time is a uh, very eerie and cool and synchronistic. So uh, Fenris, if you're listening, 
I salute you, brother. Uh, I feel like we have a strong Big Riff Energy connection. And uh, please reach out, bigriffenergy at gmail.com. I would love to just say, hey, or if anybody's listening and knows how to contact the man himself, let me know. Anyway, very excited about the new Dark Throne record. The little clip I heard sounds great. So I guess now I shall go to fan questions. Josh with the paid question. Shout out to Josh, man, in Grand Rapids. Thank you for uh, supporting the channel, brother. Here we go. Hi, Nate. Love your work. And I'm curious about your writing contribution in Gate Creeper while in the band. I know they are coming out with a new full length this year. And I'm wondering if you helped write the previous material. I met you in Grand Rapids, Michigan last year. Had on the death symbolic shirt while you were on tour with Midnight. And I'm a big Spirit of Drift fan. Thank you for being... Okay, thank you for bringing Big Riff Energy to the world. Sincerely, Josh. I remember you, Josh. Uh, I'm not sure if it was you and your buddy, but it was so funny. The last date of the Corrosion of Conformity tour that we did was at Pyramid Scheme in Grand Rapids. And then the first date of the next tour we did with Midnight was at the Pyramid Scheme in Grand Rapids. And I think there were two guys who were at the merch table at the end of the COC night and at the beginning of the midnight night. So, but I definitely remember you with the symbolic shirt. I remember talking about that album. Great album. Uh, yeah, good question, man. I didn't write very much in Gate Creeper. Hardly anything, really. Uh, I, you know, I think at this point, my favorite releases by that band are probably the first record, Sonoran Deprivation, which I wrote none of. And if we're counting EPs and splits and stuff like that, Honestly, my favorite thing that that band ever put out might be the Iron Reagan split on Relapse. Uh, the songs on that are good. They were like a lot of fun to play live too. Um, I, I just feel like that our contribution to that split encapsulated all the best elements of that band. Uh, and I wrote none of that also. So those are my two favorite things. Uh, let's see. We did a seven inch called Sweltering Madness and I wrote the second track on that. I think it was called Mastery of Power or something like that. And I remember we toured with Nails around that time and Todd from Nails dug that song, which made me feel very good. Love that guy. Uh, what else? Around the time of Deserted, Chase and I co-wrote a couple songs. I wrote one called Social Decay. That's that's my favorite thing I wrote for Gate Creeper, for sure. And I think that was a co-write with Chase. That ended up being a decibel flexi single or something. But that's one of my favorite Gate Creeper songs, for sure. And I, I wrote that one, Social Decay. And then Chase and I wrote a song called Anxiety, which, what was that? Adult Swim single or something like that. And I think those two songs ended up on uh, pretty sure in Japan, when you put a record out, you have to have like bonus material. So I think on the Japanese CD version of Deserted, those two songs are at the end, maybe. Uh, other than that, my contributions were pretty limited to the band. I think uh, I sort of wrote some tales, I would say, on a... The fast song on Deserted with the uh, Puncture Wound. I think it's called Puncture Wounds. There's like different endings, different tales to the fast riff. I think I might have like come up with one of those. Just minor shit. Uh, but for the most part, is you know, Chase and Eric writing songs. And that's the way it had to work because I was writing all the Spirit of Drift stuff and demoing all the Spirit of Drift stuff. They were doing all the Gate Creeper stuff. It was going on simultaneously. Both bands were recording or touring at all times for like four years. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I, those guys know what they're doing with that stuff. And I know what I'm doing with, with my stuff and it worked out well that way. But I would say I really like that song, uh, uh, Social Decay. So see if you can find that one. And I, I, I was very much inspired by uh, the first four fret. I remember Chase gave me a, a mission i think writing that other song mastery of power he said see if you can write something that doesn't go beyond the first four frets of the guitar so i was like all right and i did came out good 
Okay, our mystery man that I mentioned at the beginning of the episode. Uh, how do I want to approach it? I'll just read the email and then give my thoughts on his band. But, but I was very uh, flattered by this email, dude. It's good to hear from you. Hey, Nate, uh, don't know if you remember me. We hung out in Philly maybe seven to eight years ago when you were touring with Paul Bear. I randomly came across your podcast the other day and I'm now binging. I love what you're doing. Glad to see life seems to be treating you well. I'm watching your Russian Thraster, Thraster piece episode. <laughs> that Aspid record is so great. Nuclear War now is truly doing the Lord's work, reissuing these criminally underrated records. Have you checked out Credo? C-R-E-D-O. Album's called Paying for Everything. That record has not left my turntable for the past couple of months. The Iron Curtain really did a thing to these starved headbangers. You can hear the excitement and genuine love for the music in these recordings. Total true metal and very inspiring. Also been listening to the first four Pokal Gep records, P-O-K-O-L-G-E-P, over the past few years helped me get through some riff road blocks while writing the new Piss Grave record. Not sure if you're familiar. Grabbed a copy of this before it sold out and thought I'd shoot it your way. So cool there's some diehards out there digging into this stuff and sharing with whoever's interested. Hope we cross paths again. Really cool how you're getting people connected during these rough times. Keep up the great work. Tim Mellon from Pissgrave. Good to hear from you, dude. Man, uh, thank you for the nice words. I do remember hanging out. And oddly enough, like I was trying to recall that memory of us. I'm pretty sure at Kung Fu Necktie, if I had to guess. And what, what brought it back to me is your tattoo on your right arm. Because uh, there's just, I've never seen anybody with a tattoo quite like this. It's like a blackout that's like disintegrating into weird upside down crosses and shit. Uh, and I just have like a visual recollection of standing and talking to you and seeing that tattoo. Uh, yeah, guys, we need bands like Pissgrave. If you haven't heard them, uh, this shit is really like sort of too brutal for me to be on it. Like it makes me feel like a poser. Uh, you know, there's, there's bands that are extreme and there's bands that are like extreme. And it, while I think that portal from Australia is, uh, maybe as or more extreme, but in sort of an avant garde kind of way, I think Pissgrave is the most extreme and most brutal death metal band. Uh, since the first wave of death metal or, or maybe like, I mean, it's all contextual, right? Deicide was insane in 1988, 89 blaspheming in the state of Florida where it's not really cool to do that. Uh, but for the modern era to me, Pissgrave is the most brutal shit that there is. And so brutal that, uh, I think you guys like had a pop for a minute there. Cause, uh, the melon Fantano, reviewed the first record um and so i think it's good to have a pop like that but i think it also brings along a lot of uh interlopers and posers and wimps and falses wimps and posers leave the hall type people uh and you guys you guys like ran them off with your next album which <laughs> i appreciate that so much dude um yeah, you know, the first Pissgrave record is is insane and the cover is insane. We got a lot of death metal bands out here with, you know, cartoony artwork of people getting killed and stuff like that. Pissgrave's putting photographs of like rotted, disintegrated human bodies in bathtubs and shit. <laughs> it just, man, I appreciate that in the same sense that like when I was very young and just on this like active search for the most brutal extreme stuff I could find, whether it was movies or music or whatever, you get to cannibal Holocaust and you're like, all right, that's it. That's it. That is like the most brutal thing that I can still appreciate, you know? And I feel that way about piss grave, man. Uh, everybody was kind of, yeah, like the fair weather. I don't know posers were were into the band because they got a needle drop review and stuff and uh <laughs> so the next record what do they do they put an exploded head 
on the cover, uh, just a head with every, every like component of the head is in the wrong place. Uh, what is that one called? Posthumous humiliation. I can't put it on the screen or this video will get banned, but you can look it up. And dude, I remember, I remember the reaction to that. And even people who are like been into metal, like their whole lives who consider themselves like lifers or true metal people, like the whole internet was just like, Oh man. Okay. This is too far. This is too brutal for me. This is too much. That's somebody's family members. Like, dude, it's death metal. Come on. So I like, I like going all the way with stuff. <laughs> like if you're going to do something, do it as hard as possible and go as far with it and put as much into it as you can. And dude, I, I Tim, I appreciate what y'all did and are doing. And, uh, I can't, <laughs> Yeah, you're just like weeding out, you're helping, you're like setting up a blockade to weed out all the people that ruin the thing that we love. Uh, and I, I appreciate that aspect of what you're doing. And I also just appreciate the whole thing, not just musically, but as a piece of like performance art. Because that's what it is to me. Like not corny performance art, but it's just a cohesive message to to those who think that they want to get into our world. Uh, and it was funny to watch those people get destroyed in real time by that last album cover. So I can't wait to see what your next album cover is. So shout out to Pissgrave. Good to hear from you, Tim. All right. Uh, Andreas from a band called Vaticinal Rights. So it's like V-A-T-I-C-I-N-A-L rights, R-I-T-E-S. Uh, I wouldn't be shouting this out if I didn't like it, but I do like it. Andreas says, I'm a regular listener of the channel and wanted to share my band's first single, which came out last week and will be featuring on our upcoming debut album entitled Cascading Memories of Immortality. That's a pretty good album title. Uh, the record, it's not a declarative sentence like Ulcerate, you know, stare into death and be still, but it's good. It's good. The record will be released on... May 10th via Everlasting Spew Records. You might hear some influence from the likes of Monstrosity, Early Sinister, Morbid Angel, and Disincarnate. So if you're into those bands, which I presume you are, then I think you'll like this. If you're digging it, I can send you the album in full for you to take a listen. Cheers. So everybody, if you like death metal, uh, this is like much more accessible than Pissgrave. Yeah. Monstrosity, Early Sinister, Morbid Angel. Really good stuff. And yeah, Andreas, please email me the full album if you are listening. And shout out to Vaticinal Rights with Cascading Memories of Immortality. Uh, Andreas did not pay me to say this, I promise. I, I actually really liked it. Uh, Steve, this is an old question I'm finally getting around to. Can you recall a depiction of metal or heavy music in film or TV that was not cringy or poser? <laughs> For example, I'm not sure if you've seen recent movies like Lords of Chaos or Sound of Metal. In retrospect, maybe Spinal Tap is actually the most realistic metal movie. Yeah, it is. Uh, Spinal Tap and Walk Hard with John C. Riley. Walk Hard's not metal, but I actually had a conversation with Trevor from Obituary. We were on the uh, Obituary tour bus and talking about Spinal Tap and Walk Hard and and we didn't want to say it, but we kind of were hint hinting around it. And he finally said it. He said, man, I love Spinal Tap, but you know what? I think Walk Hard is even more accurate and better. And it, to me, those are the two movies. If you want to know what it's like to be a lifer, songwriter, musician, watch Spinal Tap and watch Walk Hard. Um, metal in, in movies, I mean, TV, Metalocalypse, obviously. I love Metal Ocalypse. Like, unironically love the first Death Clock album. Listen to uh, Go Into the Water, and you will hear the influence that Brendan Small's riffs have had on people like me. Uh, of course, he's just sort of channeling King Diamond and old school metal, but uh, it's great stuff. Uh, TV, yeah, Trick or Treat. There's a Trick or Treat horror movie that's really good, but Trick or Treat from the 80s? That's my favorite, like, heavy metal movie. 
And my favorite aspect of that movie is that Ozzy plays like a conservative um, PMRC pro censorship, like worried about satanic panic type of like um, talking head, you know, TV pundit. And he's all over the TV, you know, talk shows talking about how evil heavy metal is and stuff. And he, dude, his performance is like dead on. And it must be because he had to deal with those kind of people. He had a lot of experience uh, being picked apart himself by those sort of like evangelical, yeah, Tipper Gore, PMRC, yeah, anti-First Amendment fucking scum. And people are still trying to fucking shit all over free speech, man. What's up with that? In the 80s, it was the PMRC and, uh, you know, scared ass Christian housewives that never left their house. And, uh, it seems like the perpetrators of the anti free speech thing have sort of shifted. Uh, but anyway, yeah, check out trick or treat from the eighties and obviously, uh, cannibal corpse and Ace Ventura, man, come on. Okay. Couple more emails here. Then we're going to wrap this up. So, uh, what was that last episode? Two episodes ago. My last episode is the chat with TJ from Inner Arma. Check it out if you haven't. Came out on Saturday. I think the episode before that, I had literal Lee talking about uh, Nick Drake and Todd Rundgren and stuff. I sort of gave my two cents on that, but I had a lot of people hit me up saying, dude, you need to listen to Nick Drake. Lee said it. Uh, Tony Fast and Bulbous said it. And my boy Rippy, man. I worked with Rippy and toured around the USA in Gate Creeper with this man. Let me throw up a couple of pictures of us, man. I went digging because Rippy will text me every once in a while and we'll uh, reminisce on the, the good old days. I have way less gray hair in some of these pictures. Can't even tell who's who sometimes. But yeah, all of y'all were telling me, listen to Nick Drake, right? And I was out hiking and let me clarify, hippies and Twig boys and granola folks do not have a monopoly on hiking. I will have you remember that Schwarzenegger's hiking at the beginning of Commando. Stallone is technically sort of on a hike in First Blood when he's setting up booby traps to kill all the cops. Uh, so yeah, I was doing that kind of hike. <laughs> and I, uh, I put on Nick Drake. And that album, Pink Moon, it's him and a guitar. One song has a piano overdub. Uh, and he killed himself pretty shortly after he made the album. Dude, it's... Yeah, it's one of the best singer-songwriter, sad, acoustic-type things I've ever heard, man. I've been listening to it every day since then. So thank you, guys. Nick Drake for sure had the big riff energy. Um, listening to it, you can tell that uh, he's just one of those guys that didn't have as long of a... A life as your average human you know I, I don't know how else to you get you just hear certain people and you know like uh he's not gonna make it you know and he has that for sure really powerful stuff so yeah check out uh, pink moon by nick drake when you're on a alpha male hike john hey nate since you suggested it i've been listening to the new chapel of disease album one of the best albums I've heard in a long time. My mental health has taken a downturn in the last few months, and I honestly believe this album is one of the things keeping me alive. Hard to find, though. I ordered a copy from the Netherlands. It will arrive eventually. I just wanted to thank you for this recommendation because I'd never heard this band before. Also, a comment you made on the same episode inspired me. I'm working on a new music project, and I've been developing a harsh vocal that I've never used before. I've always been a clean singer. I've decided to rearrange the songs to use only clean singing. I think people don't do it enough in metal. It's the first time I'm playing all instruments myself except guitar solos. Let's see how this goes. Just wanted to thank you for the inspiration and the suggestions. Hell yeah, John. Man, I repeat it again. Like This is why I do this thing. I, when, I, when I was younger, I would see... Like I talked about on this episode, I'd see pictures of Max Cavalera or Phil Anselmo or James Hetfield wearing a trouble shirt or a dark throne shirt or a crowbar shirt. I'd look through those liner notes, you know, listen to Radio Fenris. 
that episode in 2018 where he played us, he played Hellas as well. So obviously that man's ahead of the curve. <laughs> let's uh, let's respect not only his musical ability but his taste and his uh, foresight. You know. So I guess podcasts are kind of like the new way of uh, doing that for for other people, like paying that forward. You know. Uh, I got the Ashbury shirt on today. I've talked about them before. I mean, it took them 40 years to get their credit that they deserved. You know, I, I still don't think they've gotten the credit they deserve. So um, guys like Fenris, guys like Phil Anselmo, guys like Max Cavalera, you know, even hear Lars Ulrich stays real connected to what's new and cool in the metal world. Um, some folks that run a metal college radio station in Colorado told us that Hetfield is listening all the time, calling in making requests. So respect to those guys, respect to anybody that, that passes that forward. You know, every single one of those dudes was given a, given a shot or given a chance or, uh, somebody that was more established than them shouted them out or put respect on it. And so I'm just really glad to be able to do the same thing. Might not be on the scale that they did it, but everything counts, man. So I'm glad to have helped connect you with Chapel of Disease and uh, send your riffs over when you get them recorded, man. Okay, so that's it. Dark Phone rules, Fenris rules. But I don't think I ever got to my top five, though. I think I did four. So what would the top five be? Blaze in the Northern Sky. Maybe I did do five. Hate, hate them. Uh, Sardonic Wrath, just because of the nostalgic thing. Old Star, which might be my favorite. Um, and I think I said Transylvanian Hunger. Just I don't even really like, like that album. But just for the nostalgia and the, the... That was like the first extreme... That was the first black metal album I ever heard. And I mean, that is the most black metal album of all the black metal albums. Uh, but I don't know if it's in my top five. Uh, what else? Um, Cult is Alive is okay. Fuck off and die. The one Philip told me about. That one's okay. Uh, Underground Resistance. I'll put that on there. Yeah, so what is it? Five or six? Whatever. Um, but let's hear this new one. I'm sure it's going to be good. They're all good. They're all good. And man, 21 albums. And not one of them sounds identical to the other. What about Panzerfaust? Faust. Put that one on there. All right. What are your five favorite Dark Throne albums? What's the first extreme metal record you heard? Or the first super extreme black metal album that you heard? What band t-shirt did you see somebody wearing that introduced you to a band that really made an impact on you? Write me. Spirit Adrift. No. God damn. Big Riff Energy at gmail.com. I remind you, you can hit me with 10 bucks to support the channel and I'll move your question up to the front because I do stay pretty inundated and I love to stay inundated with things. Uh, I will see some of you on Friday at the Solitude Eternus Circle Pit and I'll see the rest of y'all on Monday. Thanks, guys. Shout out Fenris. Get in touch if you're listening or... Somebody put me in touch with the man. Thank you.